Hi everyone, and welcome to Elite Rugby SNC podcast. First off, if you haven't already, sign up and join Elite Rugby SNC today. We provide you all your strength, conditioning, speed, and recovery needs. You can try before you buy, so try our seven day, seven dollar trial to get a taste of what we offer here at Elite Rugby SNC. Sign up to our newsletter and receive free bonus content each and every single week. So take your game to the next level, become a beast, and join Elite Rugby SNC today. Today I am joined by Brumbies forwards coach Laurie Fisher also known as the Lord of Rugby. Laurie began his coaching career in 1992, coaching at his local club, known today as the Union of Owls. Laurie began his coaching at Brumbies Rugby in 2000. Laurie worked his way up through the ranks to become one of the best coaches Brumbies Rugby has seen in the last 20 years. Laurie is a major reason why the Brumbies have been so successful in the last two decades. Laurie has also coached in the Northern Hemisphere, which he shares that experience today on the podcast. On this episode, Laurie provides his thoughts on the 2022 Super Rugby season, the importance of strength and conditioning for rugby athletes. He provides advice on being more dominant when tackling and clearing out. And Laurie tells us about his story on how he became a rugby coach and much, much more. We hope you enjoy this episode. So good day, Laurie. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Kieran. Yourself? Yeah, I'm going really well, thanks. So, what are your thoughts on the 2022 uh, Super Rugby season for the Brumbies? What were some of the highs that you found, and and some of the lows, and what are some areas you're trying to um, work on for next year? Yeah, like, I mean, I, I guess it was a good season for us. I mean, we've ended up semi finalist in in a, in a in the Super Rugby Pacific, so it was a really solid season for us and. I think pleasingly we'd identified like uh, quite a few areas from the season before and probably seasons in the past where we we just needed to change our program a little bit. So not so much about how we play, but more about how we train. And we made, you know, I think we made some adjustments to timetabling and to, to actually what we were trying to achieve uh, athletically out of our training as to where we wanted to take our game. So in the end, we were disappointed with the way the season finished. We, we, we felt that we were building. We were pretty injury-free at the back end of the year. We got to the, the semi-final. We only had one one player out of 37 unavailable for selection. So we're in a good place. And, and I thought we completed well in that last game and, and gave ourselves the opportunity to win. So what we were pleased with, like, like we really identified, like I think we'd been, um, we've traditionally been a side that chases, the the, the, the Work ethic is at the centre of, of, I guess, our existence and, and our set-piece game. But we felt against the, particularly at the trans Tasman at the end of the 21 season, that against the New Zealand teams, we just weren't uh, with them in terms of reaction speed um, yeah, to, to those sort of game-changing events and felt that when, you yeah, know, that winning those small races, the ability to be powerful and quick in small spaces. So whether it's chasing an offload, whether it's first at a breakdown, whether it's support play, that we, we felt that we were just a, a metre or so behind them. And that's all it takes in a game of rugby to be not as competitive as you'd like to be. So we really changed our training model from where we would, I think traditionally over a number of years, we'd work very much you know, around that, that sort of sub-max area. Like a lot of our training, 15 on 15, Maybe somewhere between 75, 80 percent of of uh, max speed and and really not enough acceleration. So we really shortened our training, tried to make it sharp, powerful, uh, and I thought we got really good results out of that. I, I thought then when push came to shove, uh, particularly against the Kiwi teams, we matched much better in the game changing moments and. Yeah, our game didn't change that much. We played a little bit more off nine. We we maintained the essence of set piece and maul and, and a strong kick chase game. So all that, we, and we've got refinement to go. We we changed our counter attack game this year. We created good opportunities. We didn't take many opportunities. So yeah, that that's again that's the evolution of of when you change things. You mightn't get the results straight away, but you can see evidence of where it'll improve you. So. We, we're, we're, we're pleased with where we've gone and now it's important uh, to take some smaller steps ahead 
uh, forward in, in the upcoming pre-season in, in the next season. So in a good place, need to find your one, two, three, five percenters and uh, and that's what we're into at the moment, trying to find those small areas. Mm, that's awesome. I think one, one of the cool things that we saw on the Instagram was the skill aspect of it. Like you're doing some mixed mixed skills with the the bouncy net um passing soccer balls catching tennis balls and all that type of stuff i think that was really cool to see do, do you think that stuff sort of helped sort of change training a bit and just allow the players to sort of have a bit more fun as well, well it, it did and, and and again it was part of our changing our program we, as you as you know like in in any single day there's there's potentially a lot of dead time yeah if, if you hear from up at seven in the morning till say three in the afternoon. Yeah, there's strapping time. There's there's uh, what are you doing before your gym session starts after. So we tried to fill in all that dead time with with skill work. So is it is it juggling hand eye coordination? Is it um, a little bit of technique work around tackle contest around uh, around uh, set piece parts of the game around defence technique? So I really tried to keep the program busy and then, but, but not just hard work. I mean, guys, you can only do so much hard work and it becomes Groundhog Day. So I tried to have uh, parts of training that, that were fun, that were less, less focused on being absolutely perfect, but just enjoying yourselves, be prepared to make a mistake. Uh, and again, reaction, you know, coordination, uh, all those sorts of things. So again, we found that we that were able to we had a lot more time available just to, to develop those skills and I, I remember years ago when I was working at AIS uh, Brendan Dowrick who was a, a Commonwealth gold medalist for the Australian gymnastics team he had a philosophy that he if he turned up if he started the, the session 10 minutes before all the other gymnasts and he stayed 10 minutes after to do more work that's 20 minutes for every session they did nine sessions a week. So that's uh, 180 minutes. That's three hours a week that he was doing more than the other gymnasts. So it doesn't sound like much, but then over the course of a week, a month, a year, all of a sudden you've, 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 had, you've got all this extra work. And is, is it in your skill? Is it in your conditioning? It, it doesn't really matter. But it's so easy to find ways of improving if you just find little bite-sized pieces here and there. Mm, I love that. That's awesome. So was there a particular game that sort of stood out this year that you were just like, wow, this we're playing some great rugby and it was um, just really good to watch from a coaching point of view? Uh, look, look, I, I thought, um, I, I think the game that we, we really knew that we were, that we had a, a, an opportunity was against the Highlanders in, in the uh, Super End down at Melbourne. And, and our first sort of 15 or so minutes and like we, you know, we bombed the try early, dropping the ball over line. But, but the speed and accuracy uh, and control that we're able to play at, it reminded me, I watched Ireland on the weekend. And if you look at their, just their first minute and a half leading into their try, like just everybody on the same page, executing perfectly, executing at speed, everybody doing their role. And if it doesn't quite go to plan, other people pick up the slack. So it was just... Uh, so to be able to, to, to play like a good 15 minutes like that against the New Zealand side was outstanding. And then again in the second half, we scored a, a brilliant try through multiple phases where Noel Alicia scored in the left-hand corner. And again, mm. it was just executing our game and you know, our carry game, our, a little bit about our shape, our, our groundwork, our reaction to support, all those things are the six or seven phases done as good as you'd, you'd expect it to be done under the pressure of a game. So out of that game, which was our first game against the New Zealand side for, for 22, I really thought that, that we were on track to be uh, far more competitive in 22. And, and then we, you know, we grew into the Hurricanes game. We played really well against the Chiefs uh, away from home, again, scored some outstanding tries and started all those games, not so much the Hurricanes game, but certainly the Chiefs and the Highlanders game, uh, at pace, and, and we felt that we could play at a pace that was the match or greater than the New Zealand sides. So in a really good position. And um, and then when we played the the Blues at home, where we 
uh, scored a, a really good try early, but then we, we really defended for the next you know, 75 minutes. And to be able to, to defend and defend and hang in and, and, and the, the fatigue and the physicality that that, that takes, that, that I thought, again, being able to hang into a game against a quality side without the ball and really lose to a full goal uh, in the last second of the game. And, and again, you can, you, know, you, can, you can whinge about decisions and interpretations, but I thought that was another great example so that I'd seen that we could, we could uh, live with, them, with our attack game, but to be able to then uh, stop a side that had all the possession, all the field position, all the momentum to really, th th they scored um, uh, you know, two tries in 80 minutes with all that possession. So then I knew that both, both sides of our game could compete well with the New Zealand side. So it, it really, it, it gives you belief in what you're doing. Uh, gives you confidence, obviously, in the team, and a, and a real belief that you could you could go as, uh, all the way in the competition. Mm, totally, I really enjoyed the the Hurricanes game. I think I more enjoyed it because I was there live at the game, and it was just a wonderful day on a Sunday. I think it was. Or, it was a beautiful afternoon. Yeah, yeah. it was wonderful. And then, just like you said, they started off slow, but they just sort of picked, like, just dominated the rest of the game. And then that try to Rob Valentini was just incredible, and the crowd was going nuts. And yeah, Mum was asking me, turning, turning point wasn't long. Yeah, we battled away. We'd given, we, you know, we'd given away a try early on, but. Mm. But that, that, yeah, all of a sudden, it's a turning point like that generates belief and, and then we just flowed from there. Mm. We learned a lot out of that game as well because we really, uh, our, our kick chase game was poor in that game. We gave a lot of space on the open side and, and again, uh, to win a game and to have probably a, a serious error in that part of your game allowed us to, to fine tune that, which really helped us again uh, in mm. the games that followed. Mm, totally. So growing up as a young lad, how did you end up playing rugby? Was it something that was in the family already or you just sort of stumbled upon it? No, it's a family game. So my, yeah, my, my grandfather was a, he was a league, he was a, a rugby league player. He in fact, came to Canberra in the, in the, in the mid to late thirties to coach uh, the Canberra rugby league team. That's what, what sort of brought my family Canberra. So then, uh, Dad uh, and his brother they played rugby union for, for Ainsley uh, back through the um, uh, late fifties and through the through the sixties, where I was uh, a ball boy uh, over many years. And I know they made I think they played 67, 68, 69 grand final, lost all three. Mm. But uh, but so always always you know always a big part of our game and. Uh, I got an older brother, and yeah, he started when I started playing. It's the rugby started at under nines, and uh, so Gary he was he was seven and started the under nines, and and, and I said, well, by all accounts, I don't remember it, but wanted to be a part of that. So I'm he's a, I'm a five year old, probably standing on the wing doing bugger all <laughs> under nines game, but yeah, you know, but, but you're part of it, and then you just you you, you then that that becomes your lifelong. Uh, not an obsession, but uh, but certainly uh, it, it become it's in your blood and, and, and something that's been wonderful to me over uh, yeah near, near on sixty years now. Mm. So when did you decide to become a coach? What sparked that interest and passion? Because not all players want to become coaches, but um, some of them do. No, well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a uh, school teacher by trade, so obviously ha have a some instinct or inbuilt passion for um, educating people. Uh, and then I, mean, I played locally for the university club and I retired in 1992. And, and like, like all local, like all rugby clubs that you, it's impossible to just walk, walk mm. away. So I you know, played over 200 games. And so I said, well, that, that can't be, I wanted to take a year off. That's all you, you, you can't, you <laughs> just got to come and get involved. So I started coaching second grade uh, in '93, and then moved on from there. But but, but I always felt, I always felt because I, I wanted to maintain a, a lifelong involvement in the game. So I always felt I'd I'd become a coach. And I, so any any time, uh, you know, I was in the ACT squad for many years, and and we had 
Bob Hitchcock and, and John Kelsey as the main coaches, but we had, you know, we had Bob Dwyer take us for sessions. We had Alec Evans take us for sessions. And I always found myself sort of storing away information that might help me down the track. Yeah, like, like thinking from a coaching perspective as well as a player's perspective. And I think it was just a, a, a natural progression into that and, and something that I had a, that, that I, I felt I had a, I was reasonably good at and certainly had a passion for. Mm. Did you find the, the teaching aspect help you manage people and players a bit better? Yeah, I think organisationally it does wonders for you. So, so you're right. Uh, as a PE teacher, so first and a classroom teacher, so I did a little bit of both. So being able to, uh, how do you manage back in those days? But you make some classes of 32. So, mm. so how do you manage a class of 32 and some want to be there and some don't and mm. some are good listeners and some aren't. <laughs> so, so certainly you, you learn how to how to manage a crowd. And as a PE teacher, you, you learn how to how to set up drills and and uh, yeah, like a big part of, of PE teaching is, is is trying to be inclusive to give everybody opportunity. Otherwise, as you know, in, in a class of kids, some kids love their sport and other kids don't. But but you want to make it you want to make it so everybody's enjoying themselves. So how you set up your activities, uh, what sort of games you play, and and how you uh, construct them to make sure everybody's getting an opportunity to uh, enjoy their their physical education and, and and maybe understand the importance of being physically active. So you might want to go and play a sport, but you enjoy the, the concept of being physically active and, and what that does to you. So I really thought that I think that's a, a really great grounding for, for my professional coaching career. That's awesome. So you have been a coach for many years now. How has strength and conditioning evolved over your time as a coach? And what was it like when you first started compared to what it's like now? Um, I, I guess when I first, so when I first started coaching professionally in, uh, in 2000, I, I'd say that, um, that strength and conditioning and rugby were like two separate, like two separate things. Uh, so there'd, there'd be, there'd be, that side of the program, and then once you'd done that, then you'd come and and do do your rugby, and, and so uh, there's obviously huge developments in in on the strength and conditioning side in, in terms of of uh, knowledge of how you develop you know, different aspects of conditioning, but, but for me, what's changed the most is is the collaboration. And because uh, again, the game has changed dramatically in 20 years. And so to make sure that, that the game we play is being 100% supported by the uh, strength and conditioning work and uh, not everybody plays the same sort of game. Uh, I, I mean, I, I remember w when I went over to Gloucester in uh, 2014 that their strength and conditioning coach rang me up and he, he said, he said, Laurie, I, I'm excited. He said, I reckon we can put out a Ford pack this year that's uh, over 950 kilos. And I thought, gee, <laughs> that doesn't sound as though it's going to sit a, 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 a running game, you mm. know, shift the ball, that sort of game. So, so I'd never met him before. And, <laughs> and, and that's sort of getting off on, the, you know, like, like on the wrong foot. There'd been, there'd been no, there'd been no, discussion or collaboration between the rugby side and the strength and conditioning side. And we worked it out over time and a few guys dropped some kilos and, 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 and things changed. But, but the importance of, of, of everybody working towards the same goal and, and then uh, every, each, each department has their own expertise, but it's really important from a rugby perspective that, that I make sure that the strength and conditioning guys really understand how we want to play and, and where we need to be better and where we're deficient. And then they're the experts at uh, fashioning a program for the individual and for the units and for the team that then supports where we want to take our rugby. And, and to me, that's, that's the biggest uh, change that's happened. And, and um, again, being able to obviously get as, as, as much of you can, as much as you can out of the 
out of the rugby environment. You've only got so many hours in the day and, and, and you can't be running two separate programs. So we do a lot more work now uh, in the gym supporting the, the, um, the strength and condition program. So whether it's a scrum coach you know, working neck strength or, or, or back strength, you know, whether it's me trying to work on a little bit, little bit of power, you know, quick and powerful in small spaces, and then obviously them contributing out on the field as well. So I'd, I'd suggest that the collaboration, that the one dream, one team, one dream, whatever, whatever, but we're, we're all, everybody is aligned in getting the best for each athlete and the best for the team. And what, what that means in terms of, of speed, agility, bench, whatever activities you do, like it's obviously it's not, I, I did do a Bachelor of Human Movements, but it's not my particular area of expertise. But, but, but the great development is in, is in collaboration, all being on the same page and, the, and then being challenged to, 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 to find the best way to do those things. Mm. I love that. I love the collaboration and you're all striving for that one goal. So why should you be doing two different programs and not really talking to each other? You need to be able to talk and communicate and you might uh, identify one player like sweet. He's really good at doing this, but he needs to work on that. And that's probably your area of expertise. Can you help him develop that? I think that's really a, a good way to do it. And I think it's, it's showing out on the field for the Brumbies over the last sort of few years that you just, continuing to improve and just some players say for instance like Noah or Lenny Cattell just can continually improving and and taking the game to the next level it is and look but they get they get uh great coaching at the national level as well you know, I think the program that's run at the top end is is first class so that they're getting they're getting 12 months of the year like I think we run it you know, our program evolves, but I, th I think at this point in time, we're running a really good program, always room for improvement, but to, then to, to, to be getting a 12 month program that, that allows you to, to develop uh, your athletic attributes and, and your rugby attributes, I, I think is, as you say, is really showing out in, in some of those younger players. Mm, that's awesome. So an area which we have touched upon on the podcast previously is around coaching philosophy. What, what is your current coaching philosophy and how has that changed over your career from being an early uh, young coach to a more experienced coach now? Well, as, as a young coach, uh, I was all about detail and, and too much. Like, like you know, if I look back to, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a hoarder, so I, I've probably got every session I've ever coached. <laughs> either on hard drive or on, uh, on paper. I've got boxes and boxes of things. But just too much detail, it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of like in the early days, you, you need to justify yourself by, by having, uh, you know, you're taking a scrum session and, you, and you've got sort of 20 dot points, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, one degree angle here and one degree angle there. And I, I think as you go on, you, uh, the, the things like that are important, but, but but coaching detail, coaching too much detail, is uh, is really a handbrake to performance. So, so what you learn is what what you learn as you go along is is what's important. Uh, you, you you need to have a, a philosophy about how you want the game to play. And then what's in, or or the aspects that you coach, and then then what's important in that. And then you've really got to try and simplify it. So, like like complex complexity is anathema to quality performance. It really is about simplicity and, uh, and, and, and making the game and the decision making as simple as possible. So, so that when you get out there, you play and, and you play significantly on instinct, come from good preparation, and then uh, your decision making or your brain function is, is then about two or three important things rather rather than the less important things. So just over time, I'd have a philosophy of training that, that I'm chasing perfection of training. Um, but in a game, like, like you're not chasing perfection. If we can be within 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 20% of perfection in the game, then you're getting a result. Games are about, about who wins and who loses. Trainings are about, training is about uh, the quality 
uh, and your ability to repeat things un under pressure. So, so there's a different imperative to training to then to what you're judging in a game. But, but just becoming a simplifier, having a, a, a and then and that involves a lot of things. You, you, you've got to, you've got to have all the detail in your mind, but then it's just you, you've got key words, key phrases. Uh, that, that players can tune into that, that have meaning that allow you to coach on the run. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a coach who would stand there and talk or to, or to pull up a drill, happy for guys to make mistakes, uh, coach on the run, coach over the top, have everybody working, um, making sure that, 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 that there's intensity uh, in what we do. Try and pick up as much as you can as training goes through, like there's no point in doing something wrong for 20 minutes, look at it on video and say, we'll fix it next time. Mm. The, 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 the ability of a good coach is to, is to pick up small errors on the run and to address them on the run. So not, not to stop a session. If one guy's doing something wrong or not as you would like, number one, I don't stop the whole session to, to point that out. And number two, what is my skill to enable me to get the message to him about what he needs to do better next time. And that, that's just in your language and how you move around the field uh, and how you set up your drill. Uh, so simplicity is, and, and I, I, I took another big change in, in, in how I run my activities this year, where I really went down that speed power um, uh, road and, and then so did, did everything sort of on the stopwatch. So again, traditionally, you might be doing a, a, a breakdown drill and it might go for eight minutes and guys don't know how many reps they've got. They don't know how hard you want them to go and they sort of just fiddle their way through it and, and, and get it done. Whereas if, so this year, for example, I might say, listen, we, we, this is the drill. We do one rep every 15 seconds. Um, we're going for six minutes, so you might get four carries, you might get eight, four primary supports, four secondary supports, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what you got, you know, you got that. And so we've got to do every rep is at maximum power, maximum speed. And, and that was the real change in our program this year. So we're not uh, just drifting through uh, um, drills or training sessions. We, we, we know exactly what's required. We work at that 90 to 100% level of, uh, of, of max velocity, max acceleration, and um, which, which is different to what I've done previously where it would have been all about volume. So I've got to get reps, I've got to get reps, I've got to get reps. So I guess there are a couple of significant changes. Obviously the game's changed and, and what you concentrate on, but, but being a simplifier, not a, co a complexifier, focusing on, on speed, power and quality as opposed to uh, repetition would be my key changes. There's obviously a, a million and other little nuts and bolts changes, but that would be primarily where I've changed. Mm. I think all young coaches, when we start, we want to just talk heaps and do all this volume and all these type of things, but it's not until you progress over your career where you say, okay, I'm going to take a step back here. I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to talk a bit less yep. um, and just really focus on what the players are doing and the quality of it and allow them to explore movement as well instead of me just being in their ear all the time, all the time. It's like, hey, hey step back. These are the key things we're going to focus on. You go out and do the drill and then I'll time in when need to be. So I think that's really cool. What Well, that, well everybody's going to be different. Like, like not everybody moves the same and has the same capacity. So... So it's not one size fits all. You know, so there's an end result and you get judged on the end result. And a lot of time I'll say to a guy, like, like this is what we need. You need to find your best way of doing it. These are, these are the key parameters that, mm. that, that, that I need you to be conscious of. And this is the end result we want. You find your best way. And, you know, like in footwork, everybody's footwork's different. Somebody's 203 metres, somebody's five foot six and 80 kilos, someone's 140 kilos. They're all different. So you, you've got to allow them to explore uh, how they get the best out of themselves uh, physically in a game of rugby. Mm. No, that's awesome. I really enjoy that. That's awesome. So on your Instagram, you love to share content about specific drills and, and improving certain areas of the game. 
uh, a thing that I've seen you use quite a bit is resistance bands yeah. um, for tackling or jackal approach or acceleration. How have you found these bands to be successful in, in improving performance? Uh, there's, I mean, there's a couple of things that I like about using bands. I, you know, I don't use them all the time. I probably used them a little bit less this year. But I do find that, that, that resistance demands a couple of things. It demands uh, good technique. So if, if you're loose in an, a part of your body, that, that you're going to get pulled apart by resistance. So if you're loose through the hips or loose through the core or loose through a shoulder, that you're not going to be able to maintain that that uh, you know, body positive integrity that, that you need uh, to either transfer power or to or to resist force against you. So it means that you, you that you've got more th you know, thing everything turned on, which which mm. I think is not something that we're used to. That that, that you know people can be very loose, yeah, you know, very loose through the core, through the hips. And, and that particular area. So it, it demands that, that, that you turn everything on, which, which I think is, is, um, is really important to being able to execute anything in the game and, and particularly for injury prevention. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's massive for injury prevention. And uh, yeah, a, a lot of my, most of my drills would always be conscious of, of um, making players uh, robust to, to uh, survive contact to to reduce the threat of injury, so I think that's important. And, and I I, th I think the other part of the guy, the other part of it, then it, it 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 demands that you work powerfully. That, that you, you you can't you can't go slowly because then you you, you don't get to, to where you need to go. So whether you're practicing a, a poach or whether you're just uh, you know, getting quickly off the line or change of direction, it requires you to, to do it. At a certain level of speed and power, where it's it's if you're just running running a drill with no resistance, guys could be working at a, a whole range of of different intensities. So it, it really does demand that that your that your balls out in what you do. So short distance, strong resistance. If I'm not strong, powerful, and quick, I, I can't execute the drill. So I, I think it really trains you to to do that, and then to to be able to to, to, to do a drill under some resistance and then to take away the resistance and being able to execute the same way. I, I, I reckon it really, it, it gives you that innate physical ability to, to have all the appropriate muscles turned on uh, to execute what you need to execute. Mm, yeah, I to totally agree. And it's, it's a great way for athletes to understand, okay, this is what 100% means and going in hard and powerful. Some of the sort of athletes that I've coached, um, sort of more the juniors, they just don't really know how hard they can sort of go. And when, when you say as a coach, I want you to go hard in there because going soft, just like you said, if you've got one of the areas that's not turned on, that's probably where you're probably going to get injured. And the times that I've seen when you just don't go hard in contact or attacking drills, that's where you, you go injured and you're not going to be able to transfer that over to game day as well. So if you can add those bands in and use them as a tool to, under, to help the athletes understand, this is the height I need you to go in, this is the direction, this is the intent then um, take the band off, then go do it without the band as well. I think that, yeah, it's a great tool to use and it's a great way to reinforce what you want. Yeah, I agree. And it, 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 it allows you to do all those things and not, and, and not have to, to, to go live in terms of having an opposition. So, mm. yeah, there's, there's an amount of live training you want to do. But, but your, focus of your, your focus of training is, is, is not necessarily your, your aggression levels. Or your physicality, your focus is your is your your technique and the speed and power that you can execute that technique. So so without having to bang in the bodies all the time, because guys get get sick of banging in the bodies and you want to save that for the weekend, it allows you to you know, to, to replicate to replicate that without the end contact. Mm. So so again, it, it's uh, you know there's there's a reduction in that in that contact fatigue uh, element that that uh, yeah can be deleterious for performance on the weekend. Mm, no, sorry, that's awesome. Hi, everyone. We just wanted to take a break from this episode. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far and also all the content we have produced. We appreciate all the support from our listeners and followers so far. If you haven't already, sign up to Elite Rugby SNC newsletter today. 
We provide you free exclusive content each and every single week to our subscribers. Link in the bio. Remember to like, subscribe and share Elite Rugby SNC on social media to all your friends and families. So thanks again for your support and now back to the episode. So this next one's sort of a, a bit harder to answer, but what advice do you have for rugby athletes when you become more dominant when tackling and clearing out? Is there certain areas that you think are sort of vital to those performances? Well, I think good techniques is the cornerstone of everything. So, um, so, so don't worry about smashing blokes until, in, in, until you get technically good and, and being physically capable of, of coping with, with that force. Um, so uh, we don't have a big focus here on, on big hitting. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, with, with where the game's going, you know, the need to be under control uh, and to get your hitting height down to be able to react to, uh, to a change of direction from a ball carrier. So the, 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 ad, the, the key... The key in, in being dominant defender is not in your first two or three metres, it's in, in, in your last step in the contact and your body position around that. So, so I, 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 the majority of, of, to get time when you hit, we do a lot of work on last step, next step. So last step in the contact, next step in the contact. And obviously the precursor to the last step is how you move, where your hands are, how your feet are moving. Um, you know, a little bit of flexion extension. So there's a whole range to it, but generally, generally I, 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 wouldn't be encourage, I wouldn't be encouraging younger players to be looking for big hits. I'd be looking for them to, um, to, to win the gain line defensively. So get off the line, win the first two or three metres, balance yourself, be technically good, and then focus on winning the last step, next step, Good shoulder contact, good punch and pull, what, you know, whatever your coaching terminology is, um, and then if you if you've got the physical attributes to match your technical ability, and then over time you can put a little bit more into the hit. Uh, but but as I say, I think I think it's uh, the the game is steering away is is you can't play the game out of control. Uh, is that you're, you're a red card waiting to happen. So you've got to be in control at all times. So uh, a, a lot of stuff that we do would be around controlling your footwork, about the ability to flex and extend late. Um, yeah, because you, you, you need to be running tall. If, 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 you're, if you're prepared too early, too low, you get beaten by good footwork, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, people who say, well, you just tackle lower, it... it, it it, it, it can advantage the defend, the attack too often. Mm. So, so you've got a case the ability to stay tall, good footwork, flex and extend late, match footwork, put them on a shoulder. There's, there's, a, there's a lot goes through it. And if you're good at all those things, then perhaps you then earn the right to uh, really, really accelerate those last two steps and get dominance. And yeah, Hunter Poissami uh, for the Queensland Reds would be an example of that. But again, he's, he's built low to the ground. He's got fantastic timing. Len Ikatao is another guy that's just got natural timing in his defence. Uh, so it's not something I actively encourage in trying to, in trying to, to dominate, in, in dominate at the hit. We would work in trying to dominate post-contact. So mm. be in good position and, and then it's what you do after the hit that uh, is potentially more important than looking for that big hit. I think a good thing you touched upon there was yeah, getting as close as you can to that defender and then dropping your body height to make the tackle. It just reminds me of last or two weeks ago now with Pete Samu when he came off the bench. He did that late footwork to then get past the defender and score that try. So, yeah, I think that's really good advice. That's the exact point. Like, like the, uh, the back row there, uh, Lewis Ludlam, I think, like, like he lunged forward, he had his head down, he had his arms up and late, late footwork, square back up, and and it was it was yeah, that exactly right. Whereas if he stays tall, he might match his footwork. You know, he can chase an arm, and you get there. So, yeah, I, I think where the game is heading, um, and rightly so, in just with regards to, to safety, um, is that I'd I'd be coaching uh, quality technique. Look, I have that discussion with guys here because there's always talk about 
you know, young guys coming in, maybe you need to improve your physicality. Well, does that mean I need to hit big? And I, I know a player here, it was sort of a message about improving his physicality. He was, he was out and about trying to do that. He ends up with a concussion himself, looking for a big hit. Like, like there's plenty of other ways to be physical. Mm. And, and as it can be post-contact, it could be by out more league a team, out scrummaging a team, uh, shoulder rotted clean out, strong carry, a range of other things. Uh, don't coach physicality as a bell ringing hit, you know, with skin and hair flying everywhere. Like mm. I, I don't really think that's where coaching should be going. Mm. I think some of the best hits that I've seen, and it just reminds me of uh, Ben Hine, uh, an ex Brumbies and, and Summers player. He his best tackles were just on pure technique and getting himself in a really good position to dominate the tackle. He would never come out of the line and just like sort of try to shoulder charge you. It was perfect technique. And those were some of the best tackles that I've seen just because of pure technique to dominate that person. Uh, that's exactly where, where coaching needs to be. Mm. So what, what advice do you have to up and coming rugby athletes wanting to sort of progress their careers and try and make, um, and, 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 tr and try and be a Brumby or someone or try and make a team in Super Rugby? Uh, well, I reckon the first bit of advice I generally give is, is to understand that, that, um, that your body, your, your body, you know, like, like a, a trades or a workman, you, your body's your tool. So, you, so you, you've got to look after it and get it in the best condition. So, you know, nutrition, um, flexibility, uh, appropriate strength, power, aerobic conditioning, agility, all, all those things. So uh, if, 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 you haven't, if you haven't got your body in the right place, you, you're never going to get to where you need to go. And, uh, and then from there, I'd, I'd say that it's... Uh, if, you want to get, if you want to get towards the top in a professional rugby, it's important it's important to try and find a, a little bit of point of difference about what you do and then to spend time enhancing that point of difference. Again, a lot of, when people come into programs, it's a lot about when you've got to, you, you know, you're not good at this, you're not good at this, you've got to get better at this, you've got to get better at that. Whereas, so you can spend 80% of your time trying to get better at the things that you're not fantastic at and you only spend 20 of your time at enhancing your top end attributes. And I, and I think you, you've got to be careful in how we message that, 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 that what attracted you to a player in terms of recruitment, then make that, give them the opportunity to make that better and better and better. And the, and the stuff that, that they might be not so good at, well, we know we've got to get it to a level of acceptability, but we don't need to spend all our time to, to make that an absolute strength because he's already got strengths. He's just, he's just got to be good enough in the other areas. So I'm just mindful of, of giving of, of, of too much advice in all these areas and, and, and make sure I'm giving positive feedback as opposed to this is what you can do, not what you can't do. Uh, this is what you need to enhance and this is what you need to bring up. So, so how, how you fashion that in terms of your conversation with players. And, and I've always been, I guess, fanatical about uh, being technically good, so apply apply yourself. Yeah, you know, whether it's catch pass, uh, whether it's it's how you carry ball, whether it's tackle technique, whether it's how you work the ground, that that concentrate and be technically good in what you do at training. Because if if you're not technically good at training, then then you you minimise your chances of being effective in a game. Whereas if you're technically perfect at training, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy in your bottom hand when you're passing. Like concentrate, you're only gonna train for an hour. So get your head in it, focus, get as much out of it as you can, be technically good and, and you will make progress. So be your own best coach, be self-aware. Uh, understand, if you don't understand what the coach is asking for, ask him so that then you can be your own coach uh, out there. So. It's those sorts of things. There's no one things, but 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 uh, make make sure that, that, that your body can deliver what you needed to deliver. Make sure you understand what good technique is and work diligently on executing good technique. And once you once you deliver good technique, then you can increase speed, power, 
and physicality in your game, but don't chase physicality mm. before you chase uh, quality uh, technique that's repeatable uh, under fatigue and under pressure. Mm. And no. uh, uh, on top of all that, enjoy enjoy doing it. So make mm. make sure that it's that it's fun. Because if it's not fun, mm. you're not going to devote yourself appropriately to it. Mm, no, that's awesome. That's great advice. And yeah, I love that last point. Have fun. Trust the process and enjoy that process and, and see where it takes you. If it doesn't take you to where you want it to go, at least you've enjoyed and, and had some fun along the way, making some good friends and um, and, and playing the sport that you do do love. Well, rugby's, mag- I mean, all sports, but, but rugby's magnificent for that, that it's, uh, it's, it's an entree to the world. And uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough that that uh, I've got uh, friends and acquaintances all over the world now through rugby that uh, either come here or I can go there and it's, or you, you, your kids can go and stay with people. Like it's, uh, mm. it, it's a superb way to um, uh, introduce yourself into a new community, make friends. Uh, mm. Sport, sport is, is wonderful for that. Mm, it's awesome. So last couple of questions. Um, so what is the culture and environment like at Brumbies? Because it seems every year that the team produces just world-class players and coaches. Can you give us a bit of an insight into that culture and environment? Yeah, look, I, I think we're very lucky in Canberra here. It's, a, it's getting bigger, but it's a, it's a small place. So, um, so we, and, and look, I'm not every other side tries to do it. I'm sure, but we really have a family, a family focus. So it doesn't t- it doesn't take long to get anywhere. So it, we're a, a really strong, and, and and it's it's led by the players, but 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 to make sure that it's a family atmosphere. So so, so to make sure that you know that we're like brothers, so we look after each other. To make sure that wives, girlfriends, kids that everybody's involved um, in, in the club uh, as, as not, not just a game of rugby, not just a job, but as, as, an, as, a, as a, a way of life for everybody. So whether, whether you're in town for one year or 10 years, that that, that, that concept of family is underpinning the, the whole way the organisation uh, operates uh, I think is fundamental and, and, and not just doing lip service to that. So making sure that we do, uh, that we look after each other, that we're, we're aware of when guys are doing it tough or when uh, wives or girlfriends or whatever are doing it tough. So there's a real um, under, understanding of, of um, you know, life here, but life away from rugby. And I, 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 think, that, I think that's the cornerstone uh, is is that is that g- genuine family values, and then and then there's yeah you know, we, we we've sort of got five pillars that we work at um, about about responsibility, about empowerment, about hard work, about resilience, and about having a winning mindset. And and, and again, we we make sure that, that that we teach all players what what those five pillars mean and how they contribute. To, to what the organ what the organisation is, to make sure that that people trust that those pillars will will take us and and, and believe in what we're trying to do. So it, it's up in the team room. There's constant there's regular messaging about those important things. So that so that we are we're trying to become a better rugby team and better rugby players. But there's there's all these other things. Uh, beyond that, that, that will make us or take us to where we want to go. And, and the absolute importance of um, what you do away from here, which will contribute to what you're able to do here, how happy you are away, how engaged you are away, how much you feel uh, part of the environment will, will allow you then to, to d- d- deliver more in the environment. So mm. it's a real balance off field, there's there's a huge cultural component to it as well, and we we do a lot of work around understanding, respecting uh, the Pacific the Pacific Islands uh, and their cultures and and the diversity that they bring. Uh, again, we, we, which is absolutely fantastic. I, you know, I saw a show on last night on TV, Backroads or whatever it was, and uh, she was in Luton and. Now they've got Afghanistans and Italians originally, and they've got 30 odd nationalities in the town now. And just the the diversity that brings, 
which is, I mean, what a great life experience for everybody to be, to be able to uh, be a part of somebody else's life and somebody else's culture. So just being open to all those things and, uh, and delivering on them, I, I guess, on a daily basis. Mm, no, it's fantastic. And it, and it goes back to helping the team and helping individuals just feel valued as well. And it yeah. just, it's just going to improve performance. It, it, even if you don't get the results on the weekend, it, it still drives the culture and the environment in the organ, organization and it just makes it a better place to work as well. Yeah, it's got to be driven from within. Uh, mm. it, it can't be opposed. So whatever you do, it's got to be collective and collegiate. And and there's there's a there's a yeah you're going to manage some of those things. But but I, I think we've we've had traditionally good leaders. We've got some great leaders here uh, at the moment uh, and who really care. And, and and that's probably the first and foremost that that they really care about the about the organisation about the team. And that, that then drives up. So like a, a, a Nick White, uh, superb, like an Andy Muirhead, Al, obviously our captain. So there's, there's guys there that, uh, that, that are, are brilliant people and, and set a wonderful example of, of inclusivity uh, in our environment. Mm, no, that's awesome. So my final question, um, when you coached over in the Norman Hemisphere, what was that experience like? And did that change sort of the way you coach today? Yeah, look, I, I, I did. I, I mean, you learn. I mean, rugby, the, the game doesn't change that much. I mean, the, the elements of the game, there's just, uh, there's potentially more, you know, more of this and less of that, depending upon, you know, but that's the same in weather conditions. Like if it's, mm. if it's belting down rain, there's obviously going to be more kicking and more mauling. If it's a beautiful sunny day, there's going to be more passing, more running. So, so that's the nature of it over there is, is rugby is rugby. And honestly, rugby people are rugby people. And, and uh, they, they, you go anywhere throughout the world, they, they, there, are, there's, there are values that are common amongst rugby people all around the world. Uh, I mean, r- rugby in Ireland, uh, it, it was, you know, it's, it's a big part of the community over there. Like, I know they've got their, their Gaelic games, and, which is really sort of parish based, but, but rugby's most important over there and they're, they're wonderful people in Ireland and look I, I was extremely fortunate when I went over there because players players like Paul O'Connell like Ronan O'Gara who are now forging ahead in the coaching world like, like they were brilliant players brilliant leaders that they, they, they were coaches as well as players their dedication their leadership so I, le- I learned an incredible incredible amount over there, because I, I traditionally would have been, I, I, I would have, back in those days, look, I'll do the work and I'll provide you with the blueprint and, and you guys go and deliver it. And then over the, you know, the next 15 years, you learn that it's, a, that it's, it's far better being collaborative rather than uh, mm. handing out the finished product and understanding that, that, that how uh, smart and effective and, and useful players are uh, above and beyond the 80 minutes on, on the rugby field. So those sort of guys had unbelievable uh, game understanding, but leadership and uh, and and just ha- how they devoted themselves to the to to wanting to be successful and and, and not just for themselves and the team, but 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 they, they really had a. a um, I really wanted to perform for, for their families and, and for their supporters. And I, I remember once we were playing sale in a European game at uh, over in, in Manchester. And look, we, we were going okay, but they had a good team. They'd made the finals the year before and, and we, we weren't playing flash, but we were playing okay. And I remember Paul O'Connell in the sheds before the game that, that he said, look, we, obviously want, we obviously want to win the game. He said his biggest fear, and this is saying to this group, my biggest fear today is that we don't deliver a performance that our fans and families could be proud of. Mm. So not about winning, not about losing, but delivering a performance that fans and families could be proud of. And that's playing with your heart on your sleeve. That's leaving, that's emptying the tank. That's leaving no stone unturned. You might win, you might lose but you deliver a performance that they can be proud of. And that'll mean something different to everybody. But those sort of moments, you think, yeah, like, 
it's not just about the, the cutout pass and the this and the that. It's it's emotionally getting people to where to to then being able to just deliver whatever the game asks them to deliver. Mm. So I, I found the I, I really did learn a lot out of the Irish, Irish experience, uh, and particularly from the great players that they had at Munster. Mm. And and again, the English experience. It's a great competition. The the, the Premiership there. It's tough week in week out. Uh, anyone can beat anyone. Uh, if you're not on your game, you'll, you'll get spanked. In long seasons, you've got to t- you've got to turn up, and 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 if you're playing your, your 22 round games, you, you you've got your, your your six European games, you've got five more finals games. If you make it, you've got A games. It's rugby, rugby, rugby. So the importance of managing your time, of of of, of managing expectation, of managing workloads, uh, managing squads. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a huge juggling act to try and get it right, and uh, so yeah, I, I found that um, really enjoyable and a really good learning experience for me. Mm, awesome. So yeah, thanks for sharing that experience. So wh- where can people find you on social media if they want to reach out? Uh, well, well, I post most of my rugby stuff on on my Instagram. So. Uh, so, so I use my Instagram for sort of rugby drills and skills. I use my Twitter for comment and I use my Facebook for sort of family. So <laughs> try and keep them all separate so I'm not boring it. So I think my mm. Twitter's, um, gee, what is it? Is it uh, Laurie Fisher 2504, I think, uh, lowercase. So, so I, t- I tend to po- you know, sort of post drills um, and, and just try and share, again, the, the simplicity that I believe that things could be done at. Uh, to make players up, so to, to make sure that you know, like junior coaches can understand that, that the things that we do at the professional level are, are 100% repeatable uh, at, at any level of coaching. So simple drills done well with good purpose. So uh, I'm obviously in a little bit of a hiatus at the moment. We, we don't have a lot going on, but once we get back in the pre-season, uh, I'll get a few more ideas about about what I can change from last year. I'll you know, post a few things and and hopefully you know, pe- people find value in in um, in those, but particularly uh, at club and junior level. Awesome. I'll, I'll make sure I post the links to your Instagram and Twitter feed in the comments. So thanks for joining uh, me today, Laurie. It's been awesome to get your insight, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate you taking the time out to speak with me. I've enjoyed the conversation, Kieran. Thanks very much, mate. All right, catch you later. Cheers, all the best. So thanks for tuning into another episode of Elite Rugby SNC podcast. Remember to like, subscribe, and rate Elite Rugby SNC on Spotify, YouTube, and follow us on Instagram. Sign up to become a beast today via the link in the description or via Instagram page. Also, sign up to our newsletter and receive free bonus content each and every single week. So don't wait, make that good decision and join Elite Rugby SNC today and take your game to the next level. We'll